Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we wanna say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Gordon S. and Chris R. John Lee has returned to the show today. John is the executive chairman of Flying Nickel Corp, a company advancing the Monago Nickel Project in Mantanopa, Canada. The company is listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol FLYN and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol FLYNF. John, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you for the introduction. Well, John, nickel markets, what's your opinion on the price and outlook? Well, Andrew, I've been following the nickel market since early 2010 for more than 12 years. Um, since the advent of electric vehicles really landed uh, nickel a new purpose and meaning in, in, on earth. Um, and uh, as we've witnessed, uh, nickel about uh, six weeks ago jumped from about $10 a pound to more than $50 a pound and that triggered a halt on the Linda Meadows exchange for more than one week. So the price action is unprecedented. And I really attribute that to both, uh, well, clearly it's fundamental reasons as, as well as short-term volatility by speculators. But both the short-term and long-term, uh, nickel is probably the most bullish metal that, that I see, Andrew. And what are your thoughts on uh, what happened? What's your position on the LME canceling those trades? Well, Andrew, uh, nickel, <clears throat> nickel has always been a tricky market with uh, a volatile history. But uh, I think, in, in essence, uh, electric vehicle by 2030, according to a number of well-researched uh, investment bankers and research firms, is going to double the demand of nickel. Um, every, every, every electric vehicle you see could have anywhere from 60 pounds to up to 150 pounds of nickel in those batteries and this uh, bad this nickel battery along with 10 percent cobalt um and uh 10 manganese is becoming a de facto standards for nickel bat for electric vehicle batteries at least till 2030. and what happened in, in the lme is that i think there is a number of players uh, that being sort of um steadily uh taken up a position on the long side on, on the lme uh volkswagen in particular so these are very sticky positions of which um, they're really a very heavy, a very long-term outlook on nickel. And uh, on the short side, you have uh, a, a Chinese player, Tencent. They're the largest nickel player. They're the largest nickel producer uh, in the world. However, their nickel is come, uh, coming out of Indonesia in the form of, of uh, pig iron and laterite nickel. And that form of nickel is not deliverable uh, to the Linden Metals Exchange which is looking for 99% pure nickel. So what happened is you have a mismatch of the largest nickel player uh, in the world uh, looking to hedge their nickel production just so that, so that uh, to protect their nickel on the, on, the, on the downside. However, they were caught in a squeeze. And so that triggered a, uh, a, a suspension on the nickel, on the Linda Metals Exchange uh, for the nickel market for almost two weeks. Uh, nickel has resumed trading. I think it was back in uh, just about a month ago of all this action has taken place. However, volume, uh, LME volume is a, is a shallow, uh, is, is, is down to trickles. So I think um, according to uh, various research, and I, I don't watch the market daily, but you look into the, mar the nickel trading on the LME is about 5 to 10% daily volume of it was before all the craziness uh, began. So what that means is that, uh, Andrew, even though the nickel has stabilized at around $15 a pound, which is sort of the middle between 10 and 50, or about $30,000 a ton, you know, from, from $20,000 to $50,000 a pound a ton in the, in the crazy action uh, times, the short position uh, remain largely intact. So has the long positions of the likes of Volkswagen and the Goldman Sachs. So I don't think the chapter has played out. And we could be in for additional volatilities. <laughs> I think it could be downside. It could there could be downside if the sh some of the long position got shaken out. Uh, but however, I, I I think overall in in, in the um, in in the medium and to look to long term, 
we feel very, very bullish of, of nickel because of the structural deficit that's um, that's coming on stream. As I said, uh, um, the electric vehicle market by 2030 is going to double the nickel demand, and the uh, nickel supply is actually down 4% in 2021 compared to 2020, Andrew. John, how do you think they reconcile the books? There's lawsuits flying with this. Uh, you yes. know, there's certainly some questionable practices. Uh, how do you think they reconcile this? Free markets. <laughs> well, either the loans liquidate their position, well, the position need to be covered and they're supposed to be rollover month to month. So Andrew, for your audience, I don't know about sort of the futures market. You basically make a deposit on your position, which is anywhere from five to 10%. Of the nominal value of of the of the trade of the position uh, for nickel market, uh, I believe it's about 125,000 pounds per per, uh, per 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 trade. So you're looking at something something about, I think I recall I think 62,000 pounds. I think it recalls about 150,000 or 200,000 dollars of nominal value for the uh, for the nickel position. Um, the answer is the answer is much high, is, the answer is either the loans uh, liquidated position or the position will be squared. So whatever the price that they squared the position, we have we have to see which which one blinked their eye first. However, uh, LME, which is owned by the Linden Stock Exchange, uh, LME, which is owned by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, that bought LME about seven eight years ago. So they have a linkage to the uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party, of which has a linkage to Jing San, which is the largest short position, um, which holds more than 50% of the short position on, on the LMB. They have made a number of special accommodations. <laughs> so, for example, there is a daily trading limit uh, below or above that limit, you know, nickel cannot trade. And secondly, they've also allowed uh, special players, certain players, to, to be able to roll over their position without actually rolling over. So, that, so Ching San can actually pay a, a fee and not having to roll over their position. Um, so these are very special accommodations, which never been seen on the LME or Comex for that matter. However, you know they're designed to really shake out the weekend. As I said, though, uh, as I said, though, some of the loan players like Volkswagen and Goldman Sachs. They are very well endowed, so I don't think they're going to be shaken out that easily. And the nickel, the LMB, also has raised their margin to more than fifty thousand dollars per trade. So I think, by and large, the retail investors, and I think they went from about ten thousand dollars when I was long on nickel, they were ten thousand dollar margin, and now they're fifty thousand. I believe that, by and large, the uh, and also because of the redu reduction of the trading volume. The, the retail investor, by and large, uh, have all but disappeared. In my view, the longer that the nickel uh, price stays at around thirty thousand dollars per ton, which is what the LME is trading, or about fifteen dollars a pound, uh, the more bullish uh, the outlook for nickel is. Because eventually, it doesn't matter how the market is managed uh, in favor of either the long side or the short side. Clearly, right now, I believe they're favoring the short side. But eventually, the fundamentals will have to dictate the dictate the price action, and fundamental couldn't be more bullish with just all the guys are looking for for nickel, and also even in the short term, you know you have Norals, which is um, which uh, which is probably the number four, number five largest nickel producer in the world that account for about fifteen to twenty percent of all the nickel production. Uh, they're they're being under sanction by um, by by Europeans, and they're talk about. Uh, the, the the nickel from Norilsk will not be accepted on the LME um, warehouse. Uh, I think there's a lot of talk about it, whether it hasn't hasn't so far materialized. Um, but if that were to happen, that would be another that would be another major catalyst uh, for for the nickel on the upside. So all in all, with the geo geopolitical factor, with the long term fundamentals of the EV market, of which uh, nickel is a defector standard for the the batteries, and then coupled with just the structure of trading on the long side by 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 players are that have that are well endowed and, and actually looking for the physical metal. Uh, all those factors that I think will bodes very well for, for the nickel market. And if, if nickel doesn't so sort of stage on a in, on a correction to shake off further weak long hands, then the direction for nickel is, is getting more bullish by the day.
it's a bit long winding answer, Andrew. It's a complex market. Hopefully, I've dissected it well for for your audience. Yeah, I appreciate it. Good to be the king. You know, it's, it's, it sets a dangerous precedent for a lot of other things, but I appreciate the your, your opinions on it and some of the dynamics that maybe not everybody is aware of. The supply side, can you just speak a little bit more to the supply side, John, and, and how you see, you know, obviously the Russia-Ukraine war impacting that? What's your comments on supply? Nickel has gone through almost a 15-year bear market. So last time we saw nickel over $15 a pound, which is about $30,000 per ton, was back in about 2009, 2010, when nickel went to 22 a pound. And now nickel has, has endured more than a decade of the bear market. And the reason for that was nickel was, you know, before the advent of EV about four years ago, it's mostly used for stainless steel. And uh, on the supply side, the nickel supply uh, is, being, is being sort of given a booster by laterites. So these are nickel coming out of Indonesia and coming out of uh, Philippines. It's a very dirty process, uh, but the nickel produced is a byproduct from sort of literally burning laterite. Um, um, and uh, so you have this pink iron uh, and, and that is iron of, of, uh, with nickel content of upwards of maybe 10, 20, or 30%. And from there, instead of, instead of um, nickel being, being refined into 99% pure nickel, they actually dilute that nickel down to 2 or 3 or 5%, depending on the grade of the stainless steel. So in some way, this nickel ladder right coming out of the ground was intermediate pro inter intermediary product that fed, that's been fed back into the uh, nickel pick iron furnace to produce stainless steel. Um, those grades are not the best stainless steel uh, uh, usage. Uh, however, I think satisfy majority of the stainless steel uh, consumption. And these are what you use in constructions and also in your uh, utensils, for example. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a shiny product. It's anti-corrosive, it's anti-rust. So it's been a very popular product um, in, in, for, jet, for jet for more than generation. But however, the nickel price was really sort of dictated by increase in the nickel supply from the latter market, uh, coupled with a bit of uh, just a steady demand. However, I think it's just going closing note on the supply side. But however, what you witness is the decline of uh, mailing of investment into nickel mining, given the tepid uh, price action and and the, and the and the bear market in the last 12 years with the price hovering between $4 a pound to $11 a pound. And what you see there is the sulfide, nickel sulfide, which is the traditional form of nickel ore. Um, and that, that's been refined into pure nickel, 99% nickel pallets and nickel plates. So nickel sulfide is, uh, production has been on the decline in the last, well, in the last five years. Um, and, um, and because there's been not investment into new uh, nickel sulfide mines, and even for the case of ladder, right, it's a very notorious market to, uh, it's a very notorious um, resource and uh, ore to refine and to sort of extract uh, pick iron. As you've seen a lot of the big, tens of billions of dollars pouring to the ladder right market, but very few of them are successfully able to extract um, a nickel, mostly Chinese, but because the process is very highly polluted and, and some of them are not up to the highest environmental standards. You are seeing a number of players like Valet they're pulling out of the lottery market from um, Madagascar, Goro, and also in in in, um, in uh, New Caledonia. So I think overall, sort of just to just to uh, just to conclude uh, on the so on the supply side, I think you're seeing structure deficit on nickel sulfide because they're getting very hard to find, and the cost of production is much higher in the lottery. Right? Uh, on the lottery right side, already, however, due to the metallurgical uh, complexities. The laterites are able to extract it for pick iron already being sort of in a steady state. And, 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 uh, the capbacks to getting these laterites out of the ground is very cost prohibitive. And not to mention also that it's a very dirty process and requires a lot of power. Certainly would not be a good fit for the electric vehicle of mandate and initiative. So you've got this new company, Flying Nickel. Yes. Well, first, actually, John, why don't you tell us how you came up with the name and then also how you got this uh, nickel.com domain? <laughs> well, we want the name to be uh, catchy and um, 
we we have our sister company Silver Elephants, and you know people remember the company by name. Um, as I look into the future of nickel, and I'm very bullish on power. Uh, and uh, so Andrew, you know, if you look at China, despite its progress in economic development, it still still consumes only 30% of per capita of power electricity consumption versus China. And then if we look at say India, right? India is one third of China, which is what China was 10 years ago. So there you look at the two most populous nation that's that count for over 30% of the world population that are on the ramp on the sort of big ramp up on power consumption to catch up to that of the United States. And where is that gonna power is gonna come from? So I'm very bullish on betting on power. Now we can bet on power on either the power generation, which is some of the guys drew on uranium. Or you can get a bet on storage, which is battery. Um, and, and that's why I really sort of looking at the nickel market. I studied nickel market and nickel, even though it's about the same was 10 years ago, is really completely different metal. And we're only seeing the beginning of it. And I like the name fly nickel. First of all, it's got a good cachet to it. But I think that for, for electric vehicle, it's only the starting point. Uh, Elon Musk talking about uh, artificial intelligence, which is really what uh, which is really what um, uh, Tesla is all about. And he's now talking about putting a robot uh, on, a, on an everyday household to do chores, taking care of the elderly, taking care of lonely people, cooking, doing house chores, um, and uh, you know, putting uh, put together your furniture, et cetera. It's this amazing event. And not only that, um, if you look at the further uh, aerospace, um, uh, if you look at the 777, uh, 777 uh, in, in, in Bowen, a lot of the um, energy storage are now um, are, are lithium and nickel batteries, and and they're already um, air taxis um, that were that having nickel batteries installed in them. But if you go the further out, let's think for a bit. I think fossil fuels, uh, human beings on Earth have the have the sort of uh, have that luxury of, of burning fossil fuels. But eventually, if we were to go to Mars, for example, well, there's no oxygen on Mars. On Mars, So you have to find ways to ge harness, generate power, first of all, and to store that power. And, and, and that's why I, I think Fly Nickel, we've been around for 10 years. I think the, the company is gonna be, um, has a, a, I believe, a world-class asset. And it's gonna be there for a long, long time to come. And the last thing you want, um, Andrew is to have a name of a company that go out of style and they have to change again because the circum because the market circumstances. So I think this combination of just the market future for nickel as I see venturing into aerospace and just a bit of a cachet of this interesting name and our logo has got a UFO on it. Uh, I thought just being couldn't be more appropriate for the company. So the Monago project was spun out from Silver Elephant. How's uh, Silver Elephant doing? Silver so Elephant is doing well. I mean, Andrew, just a bit of uh, sort of uh, history. I've been in the resource sector for almost 20 years and the first 10 as a private investor for my dot-com retirement. And since 2000, I started Silver Elephant, which was a hobby that turned into a full-time job since then. I raised well over $120 million for Silver Elephant and acquired over 10 mineral projects uh, based on the top-down uh, timing and bottom of research of over 200 projects. Um, and, and in January 2022, which is three months ago, Elephant restructured into four companies. So we have one focused on, on silver, and that's Silver Elephant. We have a Vanadian company. We have a nickel company. And then we also have a royalty uh, investment company. Uh, and, uh, and, and nickel, Fly Nickel, was the product of that that got spun out of Silver Elephant in 2022. While nickel, Fly Nickel focused on nickel, and Silver Elephant focuses on silver. Uh, the, the, the silver company has been treading water since we talked about 18 months ago, and partly because I think uh, silver has been consolidating between $22 and $30 since, uh, you know, for, for almost two years now. And um, I think for, for, for the silver market to see a new way of life or see a new bull market, silver has to break out of that consolidation. And for that to happen, I think we have to see some sort of climax or peak on the dollar. We haven't seen that yet because all the geopolitics and the Fed's raising interest rates. So my view on silver is a bit more mixed, uh, not as bullish as I am on nickel. Um, I think nickel is a perfect storm that's coming. 
Okay, well, talk about the uh, capital structure, John, of this new company, Flying Nickel. Talk about the cash levels, debt, and also the share structure. Yes. Um, the Fly Nickel is a newly traded company on the Toronto Ventures Exchange. We started trading in March, just the week before the craziness of the nickel, uh, of the nickel bull market. Uh, and the company has 62 million shares outstanding. Uh, the company raised about $8.6 million as part of the IPO initial public offering process at uh, 70 cents. We have, uh, and that, uh, that $8.6 million was a sub 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 substantially taken down by two by several institutions including blackstone minerals and that is a uh, australian company at about 350 million dollar market cap um the remain so in addition in addition to that 20 percent uh, dilution uh fundraising 8.6 million about 30 percent of the uh, uh fly nickel shares is um allocated to battery metals royalty which is the spin out from Silver Elephant. So Silver Elephant kept about 30% of the shares as this uh, plan of arrangement, but instead of sitting in Silver Elephant, uh, that those shares went to, uh, nickel shares went to battery metals, which battery metals is gonna treat as a core investment. You can see that almost as a strategic investment for the long term. So therefore, uh, Fly Nickel has an excellent share structure. Uh, we're, well, we're, com we're well positioned and completely uh, fully financed for, to carry out the program for Minago in Manitoba and the Thompson Nickel Belt. And I think the structure, just real quickly, um, the program for the company or the objective company is really threefold for, for Fly Nickel. One is exploration, the company's drilling, that's in our blood, we're looking to further increases our resource base of already over 1 billion pounds of nickel at 0.74% nickel. Uh, that's pit, open pit optimized. And secondly, is to complete the permitting process. The project is fully committed, permitted and uh, we're in the process of reissuing re the Environmental Act license into Fly Nickel's name for its prior operator, in, uh, which we acquired in 2021. And, and then third is to publish a feasibility study. Um, the, the, company, the project had a feasibility study in 2011. However, a number of the parameters require update and we're very confident of, uh, of uh, completing that update in the feasibility study and release out in the market in 2022. Uh, Fly Nickel will be one of the very few juniors uh, in the nickel space that are, that's in that position to complete uh, the uh, feasibility study, complete the permitting, as well as adding uh, additional resources all in 2022. It's really a very rare feat for such an advanced project controlled by a junior in, in arguably the second largest uh, nickel sulfite uh, belt in North America uh, based on historical production. John, I want to talk more about the project in just a moment, but back on share structure, talk about your share ownership, John, what price, and then also if there are any other major shareholders that you can mention. Right. So the share structure is 62 million shares outstanding, and of which uh, uh, battery metals, which is just spun out from Silver Elephant, through part of the arrangement has 23 million shares, I think just over 34%, 35%. And then you have Blackstone Minerals that owns 6.7% uh, outstanding or 9.9% fully diluted, and that was by design. And then we have uh, another three or four institutions in Europe, in Toronto, and in New York, collectively owning another 15% of the shares. And we have a couple of retail investors are there are the uh, loyal and uh, royal loyal uh, silver elephant long-term shareholders that controls another 20 percent so if, if you look at over the 62 million shares i would say probably less than 30 percent of that is is float and that float um andrew came from the distribution of silver elephant uh to silver elephant shareholders because fly nickel was 100 percent controlled by or owned by silver elephants. I think, you know, if I just look at a high level again, it's a little bit messy answer, but around around 30% or 20 million shares are, are, are float to silver elephant shareholders. And then and then the remainder are really controlled by institutions, insider and um, and strategic shareholders such as that Blackstone. I appreciate the uh, clarifications on that, John. With respect to the new feasibility study, the existing economics of this deposit, if you can maybe mention uh, some of the economics coming out of the prior historical feasibility in terms of operating costs, capex, et cetera. Right. Well, Andrew, I, I can share some of that information, but preface that with that, it, it's a historical in nature and um, the, the resources are not economic uh, because of the hist historic uh, uh, classification in nature, so cannot be really relied on. 
However, that information is public on CDAR. Um, you're looking at an annual production based on that 2011 feasibility study of 20 million pounds a year. Um, and a capex at around $500 million uh, Canadian. Uh, well, actually, $500 million US, about $650 million Canadian. But that includes a very healthy 25% contingency. Um, and, uh, um, and per pound, um, per pound nickel production, uh, cost of nickel, operating cost per pound of nickel is at around seven to ten dollar range, depending on whether you want to include some of that byproducts. Um, that's the overburden layer in frac sands in limestone. Um, in this update, I think there are some pro, there are some upsides and downsides. I mean, clearly, uh, Andrew, the, the the inflation you don't get to account for inflation. However, Canadian dollar is uh, at a discount to U.S. dollar, whereas back then Canadian dollar was at the premium. So I think there are some there are some areas of cost adjustments on the upside, but there's also some adjustment on the downside. I do believe I think that invest based on what we see, I, I think investors should be. I mean, if you just factor in sort of a five to ten percent inflation per year, the, the project at least, if, if we look at um, if you use today's nickel price of fifteen dollars a pound, it's definitely put the project well in solid in the black uh, IRR in the fifty percent range based on the 2011 feasibility study. So we're very eager and uh, looking forward to um, provide an update um, you know, and share with our investor. I think another note, to, just to be just to bit more color, is the project is an open pit. Um, it's an open pit configuration. So I think the cost increase would be a little more modest versus uh, an underground scenario where labor cost is a, a big factor. And second is a project has uh, almost zero infrastructure costs as, as the highway literally ran through two, two kilometers from the pit. It has a hydro uh, has a hydro power in Manitoba and the utility race hasn't gone up that much. And it has, has power in the road that leads up to um, uh, uh, smelters in, in, in Sudbury. And that's where the Thompson um, concentrate go, uh, from Valley has up to, has up to. And that's also likely gonna be the scenario of where the uh, Minago concentrate is going to go up to. So I think, given the given the sort of minimal infrastructure infrastructure costs and relatively steady rates in, in power in hydro in Manitoba, and that is open different configuration, we should see that the, the parameter is pretty well uh, contained. And and um, so we look, like I said, we're looking forward to release those numbers in due course. John, and how about the recovery? Any comments you can make on the recoveries of nickel? Uh, certainly, Angela, I can see you're a well-seasoned uh, mining analyst. The ore or the resource out of Minago, Minago is situated in Thompson Nickel Belt. And that is the second largest nickel camp in North America, uh, based on the 5 billion pounds of historical nickel production. Uh, today, uh, nickel is still coming out of uh, be produced in Thompson, and that has been controlled by Valley. And Valley acquired Thompson along with Voices Bay and, and Subway from Inco about 10 years ago. The resource or uh, the ore coming out of Thompson and Ballet is almost identical in, in, uh, to, the, to the rocks coming out of uh, Minago. Um, and Ballet produced nickel from Thompson, both as combination of open pit and underground. So that concentrate is, uh, well, is, is well suited for Ballet's uh, uh, smelter in, in, in Sudbury. And also based on the 2011 extensive feasibility study, um, and metallurgical study, we know that we can produce one of the highest uh, h highest concent nickel concentrate over 20%, and it's very, very clean with very uh, low deleterious uh, byproducts and penalty um, related uh, impurities. So that is very akin to the, uh, not only is, 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 is it very similar to the concentrate in coming out of uh, Tom Sandy Valley today, but we also know that it's, it's, it's gonna be very compatible to the to valet's uh, smelting facilities in Sudbury, of which it's only getting about 50% feed right now because because of the uh, because of the low uh, out, you know decreasing output over the years of nickel sulfide of the concentrate from nickel sulfide. Uh, just just a bit more again on, on the metallurgical study, it was hundreds of pages based on the five dedicated metallurgical drill holes. That was uh, drilled in, in distinct different positions within the deposit. So we feel very, very confident. Uh, the recovery rate is around 55%, but that was based on 0.5% nickel uh, back in 20, uh, 2020, back in 2011. The resource we published uh, last year, Andrew, and just quickly, is we actually upgrade the cutoff 
so that the resource we classified over a billion pounds of nickel is at 0.75. We believe that, and so we, we sort of uh, hand selected the high grade pockets for to constitute that resource. And if we do based on that resource, 0.75 and run a metallurgical, we do believe that the recovery will go up from 55%, likely to the 70s, just because there's a very strong correlation, positive correlation between the nickel grades and the and the recovery of, of uh, metallurgical recovery. John, thank you for the information on that. Appreciate that. It's always good to check on those things. With respect to permitting, talk about the status because the permits are older, I understand, but talk about the status yeah. of the permits and then also just the overall project schedule with respect to timeframes on permitting, potential financing. Yes, Aminago has gone through a full, the full cycle of the environmental process and the Environmental Act license uh, was issued by the Manitoba government. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the province of Manitoba, um, because Minago has a, a certain number of parameters in, and so would not require a federal permit. So that Environment Act license, what we'll called the EAL, is the last piece of, uh, is, is, has made Minago show already back in 20, uh, back in 2011. And there is a limited, you know, there is a bit of commissioning by his previous operator in 2011, but it just caught the time on maybe downside. Um, over $40 million being spent on the project in 2011. So when I made EAL, that included all the environmental studies in culture, in water, in hydrology, in air, in, 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 uh, in engineering designs and waste dumps and tailings management. So the entire, the entire project was turnkey um, when we inherited it. We're very lucky uh, that, uh, that um, Andrew to actually secure the, the standing of the Environmental Act license from the man, after extended discussion with the Manitoba government, government and when we acquired the project over just over one and a half years ago. So where the project stands is that the project is fully permitted. Um, there's a minor alterations on relocation of the tailings of which we have performed um, um, the fatal flaw studies to find to be um, no any issues with the low relocation, uh, just a bit further away from the watershed. And uh, we, we expect that permit to be reissued under Fly Nichols name by the end of this year. And that would be a huge leg up among, against, you know, amongst all our other competitions in, in North America, especially for nickel sulfide projects. We're probably the top two or top three uh, nickel sulfide open pit project uh, in line to be commissioned in the world. And, and, um, and that's, that's where we are, uh, Andrew. But for, before the end of the year, uh, the objective is to uh, is to have the project be shovel ready. Um, depending on the price of nickel, if nickel were to stay at around current prices, which I don't see a reason not. If, if not, I think we're probably a little more, more bullish on nickel going forward. And also depending on the outcome of the feasibility study, um, the company could be in a position to start project financing discussion. And we have been already uh, being approached and solicited by a number of traders. Some of the world's largest traders came to us. Some of the world's largest nickel produced uh, battery produced came to us, and some of the world's largest um, uh, electric uh, automotive manufacturers came to us, and also uh, Blackstone Minerals, which is a nickel uh, advanced nickel junior nickel explorer, and they're in the process of actually building their uh, mine as we speak, commissioning their mine in Vietnam. Also speaks to the volume of the quality of the project, and and um, in interestingly, I didn't share this for the insight, which your audience may not get elsewhere is um, in those conversations I've had with the strategic optakers in batteries, in trading, and in traders, and then automotive uh, manufacturers. And I was very upfront about the earliest production timeline for Minago would be 2026. And that assumes a completion of the project financing by early 2023 and start commissioning construction in 2023 for the 2026 production timeline. None of these people were, uh, they were all undeterred. And uh, they were looking now for a pipeline of 2029 and 2030. And they were quite relieved to hear uh, our timeline, which I felt were a little bit early for their appetite. So that just goes to show that, uh, Andrew, we are in a market, nickel market. That's the de facto standards for the EV batteries. And these players are really having, they're seeing a long-term structure deficit like we're seeing right now. And they're planning for, uh, for their nickel supply well five to ten years out from where we are um that really speaks again to sort of um 
to the players and 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 um, you know to I think really to to the future of why nickel and also to the bullishness of nickel going forward. Long lead times are pretty much becoming normal, so I yes. think that's pretty much in line here. With respect to ESG, obviously increasingly important to investors. Uh, what are you doing on ESG initiatives, John, at this company, and uh, what are the plans going forward as it grows? Yes, uh, we have a very high emphasis on ESG, and not just for environmental concerns, but we, we figure that we have seen a number of investors in New York and London that have very specific mandate on the type of uh, mining companies that they're interested in investing. So to, to answer your question specifically, uh, Minago project could potentially be the lowest, the world's lowest uh, carbon footprint nickel operation. And the reason is, first of all, it's uh, it's because the power is coming from uh, Manitoba, and Manitoba is almost 100% exclusive hydropower. So that's generated by uh, by, by 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 water hydropower. So that really, um, and Manitoba is probably the greenest place to to uh, to procure power, and that really lands very well for Minago project, and that could be one of the lowest carbon footprint, and that really fits up well for the mandate for EVs versus laterized coming out of Indonesia that's coal fired, and secondly, uh, Andrew, because of the topography of Minago, it's a very flat terrain. There's not a lot of uphills and downhills, and it's uh, we have we own 200 square kilometers of land. That lands very well. It's an open pit configuration that we are uh, looking very actively in, into uh, out, um, into uh, autonomous driving and autopilot. And this technology has really gone a long way in the last five to ten years. Some of the largest mines of, of Valley in Utah and for copper, and also in Brazil for their iron ore, are fully autonomous autopilot for their mining and for their uh, transportation of ore. And what they discovered um, is that is that is that uh, through autonomous driving and pilot autopilot, they were able to reduce up to 20 or 20 percent of at least of their consumables in fuel consumptions, in in, in supplies and tires and and, and uh, equipment and wearables uh, consumables. So we are. I mean, this this project lens ideal is almost like a poster child, <laughs> a model template for a for a. For a uh, for a mining project, produce a green metal for energy for EV initiative and uh, having the lowest carbon consumption. And, and we also partner. I think as part of ESG, not only looking at minimal um, uh, carbon footprint. At the same time, uh, the project is is uh, is a hydro, is is a is a flotation. So we can also produce a hydromet. We're not we don't we're potentially not going to have any thermal plant a thermal chimney coming out of it. And not only that, uh, just I can briefly touch on First Nations. Um, the prior operators done a very good job with with the liaisoning and relationship building with the First Nations, of which we were able to pick that up and build that momentum. So I think not only do we looking are we looking at uh, low carbon footprint, but also in developing a good relationship with the First Nations. And uh, we already signed a binding MOU, spell out some of the essential terms of a uh, in, uh, social impact uh, uh, agreement. That's uh, we're hope, hoping to have it executed uh, before the end of. Um, I mean, our objective is to have that signed by the end of the year, and that really spelled out to a, spelled out to a, a very concerted, concerted, a very motivated and joint efforts uh, between Silver Elephant and the province of Manitoba, of which we have a full support, and then also the First Nations that there were traditionally occupying or traditionally sort of resident in that in that area, and I think everybody is. Uh, couldn't be more thrilled about moving this project forward for the benefit, uh, for the benefit of of all in, in economic development, in ESG, in lower in carbon footprint, and also in advancing the green initiative. John, talk about the overall strategy for Flying Nickel here. Do you see this company becoming a producer on its own here? Do you see it getting a buyout? Tell us what the overall bigger picture is. Well, Andrew, we are a team of experts in financing, geology, in engineering, environmental permitting, and also in operations. We have a combined knowledge of well over 200 years. And fortunately, because we have a sister company, like Elephant and Vanadium, so the staffing cost is shared amongst these companies. And uh, we also have exceptional industry knowledge uh, in that guides our operation in mining investments. The, uh, the chief operating officer, his name is Rob. Andrunen. He was the number. He was. He was. He's a Manitoba Thompson native. 
So Manitoba is his, is, is his backyard. He uh, came out of early retirement to join uh, Blind Nickel because he sees the future of Nickel. And it's also because of his familiarity with Minago. On the board of director, we have uh, Mark Scott, and he was the head of Manitoba for ballet. And he was also the head of Manitoba Mining Association. So you see that we have we have those uh, we brought those talents recently, and and also we have uh, also the, uh, the expertise in financing and fundraising. Um, my view on that is to do the best for our shareholders, and we're not in a hurry to look for exit strategy, even though we're being sort of approached by a number of guys are interested in the project, in the uptake and, and in other areas. And my view on that, Andrew, is uh, looking at. I think we should be, we should prepare ourselves. Um, um, and 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 advance and de-risk the project, get the project permitted, develop additional resources, and uh, publish a feasibility study so everybody could clearly see the project economics. And then um, I believe that as as, as a company's um, or a chairman and founder, we will look to buy assets when we believe it's twenty percent on the bottom, that the underlying metal price, and we would look to sell the project or venture out or exit the project. When we believe that the underlying metal, in this case nickel, is 20% from the top. So the way I see the market right now is we're going to just steady. Uh, we're not going to make any surprises or looking at even other acquisitions. We believe that there's plenty of upside to discover additional metals. I would say that the timing for um, peak of the nickel, I think nickel is gonna, not going to be replaceable by a solid state or other new technology, at least till 2030. And the market usually look, are looking forward. Uh, so I would say metal, nickel, probably going to be quite bullish in the next um, three to five years, given the structure deficit. There's not going to be many nickel mines uh, with the, because of the permitting and, and because of the cutbacks required in the commission to mine. So I would see that uh, nickel has another good minimum three to five years to come. And hopefully, Andrew, I'll come on your program maybe three to five years from now. And maybe that would be the time to start drumming our exit strategy. But um, however, I think at this time, we're just going to sort of, um, we're going to put our head down and put our boots on the ground and, and continue to get this project permitted, publish our feasibility study, get more resources, develop more resources, and be open and flexible in, in, in talking to all different play, industry players. And if the opportunity were to come at a higher nickel price or at the current nickel price, that uh, that opportunity present itself in project financing through the uh, public markets. That that would be minimal dilution with the uh, strategic investors uh, with the uh, with the good uh, financing terms and not too onerous on on the pro on the company's burden. Then we definitely are motivated to bring the project uh, into production. I mean, after all, why would you sell a project uh, if if really commands? a good cash flow for 10, 20, 30 years to come of a metal that has a uh, bright future, not only for EV, but as I said, for a lot, a lot of the other applications. And uh, so, um, you know, we see a re but, but you know what, at the same time, Andrew, that's why we really are not uh, preparing the feasibility study for, for the sake of window dressing. We really genuinely are very interested in, in looking at this project and making sure that we bring all the project's uh, glory and, and weakness to surface. So if there's any problem, let's figure out a way to tackle that and, and making sure that, you know, if we do want to bring the project into production uh, and, 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 and uh, with our team, and we're going to, of course, going to bolster that team, that we, we, we know what we're getting into. Um, and so it's a very exciting market. We're, we're not thinking about exit right now, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Very well understood, and I think you have to weigh that price and that risk as things move along here. As you know, these things are quite dynamic. This company and other companies, John, that you're involved with, what are you doing to ensure you and your team's alignment with shareholders? I think there's a, how do we align ourselves with shareholders? I own quite a bit of uh, shares, but because because uh, the company, because I've been in the company for 10 years, and we have done a lot of financing, so my stake has been diluted quite a bit. Well, I can only speak that this is my baby. Uh, I've been I've been with it for ten years. I spend more time with with this enterprise than with my kid, my and my wife, and it's majority of my professional career. I certainly want to see this project come to fruition. And secondly, I do have a lot of uh, uh, background in financing. I'm a CFA, so uh, so that we want to make sure that um, the the project finance we undertake would not be too onerous with the debt covenants that will bring the company down. 
and also in structuring a uh, in structuring a good equity uh, financing, not to uh, to take care of our existing shareholders. I think there's no better testament to protect our existing shareholders, and I think future shareholders, when they see that, they would appreciate. And and I mean I mean you know in addition to sort of getting the best terms in in in, in uh, getting the best terms for our shareholders, the other thing is just making sure that we uh, we check all the marks uh, in, in in having a board and management that have done it before uh, are very familiar with the commissioning of a mine and uh, taking and making sure we're fully compliant with the environmental standards and that we have a good safety records and have a good relationship with the local communities i mean after all i think the profit comes after uh safety and 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 making sure that we're environmental you know, environmental compliant if that answers your question and for potential investors who are listening in, Flying Nichols stands at about a 32 million Canadian market cap. What would you say to those who are listening about the promises of this company? Well, Andrew, we uh, I think we're very, very undervalued uh, compared to our peers. Uh, we have a billion pounds of nickel in the ground, and, and that is based on $40 million of prior investment and over 85,000 meters of drilling. So just imagine if you made a discovery, say today, of a greenfield ex exploration deposit. It's gonna take you $40 million just to get to where we are right now. And that's as soon as you make a discovery. Not to mention uh, the long lead time. Uh, it's gonna take you about five to 10 years to get to where we are. Assume that you're doing everything right with, with the permitting and the feasibility, with the uh, technical studies, the math studies, and et cetera. So I believe that uh, we're trading well be, 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 uh, we, we're trading beneath the replacement value. The company uh, came out of the gates, um, did quite well. It stock traded at dollar thirty nine, which is more than double, almost triple of where we are. Um, I, however, I think that enthusiasm is 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 let, let let off a bit, and nickel is consolidating. So I think in terms of technically, is pretty good entry point. Um, compared to our, if you just you know further, like the company is in very good restriction and uh, compared to other juniors, I'm not talking about producers because there are tens of billions of the market cap like DHP and, uh, and Ballet. But if you're looking for pure nickel play, such as the case of Fly Nickel, because the project has very little other byproduct, uh, it's, it's a pure nickel play. It doesn't have iron or chrome or other base metal and as, as it produces a pure concentrate and has a very respectable nickel grade of 0.74 for open pit configuration i think that's the highest that i'm aware of uh, for a green for a greenfield open pit nickel sulfide project in north america or one of the top three and then uh, it, and also looking at its, its advanced permitting status and, and it's due up for feasibility study by the end of the year um i really challenge the audience to find another sort of uh, similar project at the similar valuation. Um, if you believe the nickel uh, future of nickel and, and that, as I mentioned about my bullishness on the power electricity consumption of the world, and you can either get into the power generation business, which would be oil and, 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 uh, and solar renewables and uranium, or you can get into the power storage business of which it will be nickel and, and other forms of, of lithium and other forms of uh, energy storage you have to get into nickel i mean also or maybe for some of the tech savvy guys that um that understand technology but i wouldn't personally venture to bet a Volkswagen versus tesla because there's that technology uh risk element to it but then the common denominator no question about it is nickel and if you're going to think about nickel and we had that foresight we bought nickel.com that we really are very firm believer of nickel and i think we're going to have some campaigns on, on, on just just to sort of uh, get the nickel message out there, not particularly fly nickel, but I, I do believe that once the investor do, do, do their diligence and are bullish on nickel and looking for a pure nickel play in a political safe jurisdiction with minimal infrastructure um, spend and, 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 and low risk investment, a fly nickel should be on the top of their list. And the best way for investors to contact the company? It's uh, go to nickel.com and uh, we own that domain. Uh, uh, surprisingly, we bought it for a very modest price and uh, we were being approached uh, for people that want to buy it at three times of what we paid just four months ago. So you could go to uh, nickel.com or our company's URL is flynickel.com, F-L-Y-N-I-C-K-E-L.com. I am a pretty active trader. I have a pretty active trade. I'm pretty active at Twitter. So you can Google flynickel John Lee 
And uh, you can follow me. I do a bit of a market forecast. Uh, I'm a CFA and I used to be on the buy side. So I tell the market like it is. And then, uh, you know, the company is also trading on, uh, so you can look us up on the FLYN on TSX Ventures. We just started trading on in the U.S. under FLYNF. However, that is under the pink sheet of which we're looking to upgrade into a higher tier. And I think that was that would be quite an interesting catalyst for the U.S. investors because they would be able to, they would be able to narrow the spreads. So I think there is, you know, on the, on the corporate marketing side, an opportunity uh, for for a catalyst uh, in, in the days and weeks to come, which makes it, again a good entry point right now. John, thanks for taking the time to discuss the new company. Uh, good luck. Terrific, Andrew. Look forward to be back again soon.